Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie for Reason TV, and today we're talking with Kevin Williamson, the Deputy Managing Editor of the National Review, and also the author of the new book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Socialism. Kevin, thanks for talking. And it, Define socialism uh, for us. Well, there are two parts. Uh, one is the public provision of non-public goods, and the other is the use of central planning to get that done. What is a, a non-public good? A non-public good is something that could be uh, privately priced and consumed. In the context of this, education is something that is provided by the state, but right. doesn't need to be. So right, the, education yeah. would be a really good example of that. But there are things that are, I mean, the sort of classical public goods are things like national defense and law enforcement. But there are lots of other examples, too, and they, and they vary from context to context. One of the things I get into is, uh, in India, they have public campaigns for mosquito spraying, you know, DDT, which you can't do here but because they have horrible problems with uh, dengue fever in the cities. So that would be a pretty good example of a, of a true public good that probably needs to be publicly provided. Economic uh, central planning, um, What? Uh, give me uh, from history, what's the worst case scenario? Stalin's Russia, not so great. Uh, Hitler's Germany, not so great. Today's North Korea, pretty bad. You talk a lot about Sweden. Mm -hmm. Uh, and why it fails. It's socialist in certain ways, but we're not really talking about the state actually owning the means of production. Right. Sweden um, is the one country everyone always wants to talk about when you talk about socialism because it's a terribly attractive place. Everyone's, you know, tall and blonde and they live a long time and they're healthy and all that stuff. Sweden's not really that socialistic a country. Sweden is a country with a big welfare state and high taxes, but that's not the same thing as socialism because what Sweden doesn't have, you're right, is a very strong element of, of central planning of the economy. Sweden's actually a very enterprising, very free trade oriented country. The places where they do have a lot of socialism in the economy are mostly in the labor sector, and there is a lot of direct government management of that, and that tends to be the most dysfunctional part of their society. You talk in the book about um, socialism and the environment. What's the effect of socialism on the environment? When there's no property, it's hard to, um, it's hard to secure people's rights. It's sort of like the, the way the state-owned state -owned oil companies work. You know, if BP screws up in the Gulf, you can sue them, you can capture damages and things like that. If it's Sinopec, which is owned by the you know, government of China, well, good luck. Uh, unless you're willing to invade. Uh, they've got nuclear weapons, you know, you can't really police them. Arguably the, the single biggest reason that air quality in the United States is better now than it was 30 or 40 years ago is because of the mandated switch from leaded to unleaded gasoline. Right. Um, is that socialism? And if it is, is it so oh, bad? No, it's just regulation. I mean, there is a, a, a great deal of socialistic tendencies in, uh, in the American energy market when we're dealing with things like gas. You know, you've got things like the Pickens plan, uh, which would require that everyone use natural gas and then give them a great big subsidy to convert over to doing it, organized by a guy who has vast holdings of national, natural gas. I mean, that's just, you know, it's, it's, that's exactly where central planning goes wrong. Right. Uh, because someone's got different incentives than you do, always. Uh, now, in the book, you say flat out that Obamacare, that the president's health care reform plan, is socialist. Sure. Uh, explain how that's, that's not an overstatement. Because it's based on the premise of the government planning outcomes in the marketplace. And, it's, and it happens at this level of statistical abstraction where they came in and said, well, the United States spends X percentage of GDP on health care and Switzerland spends less than X and therefore we're going to have a federal policy that's going to manage health care production and consumption in order to bring it down below the statistical level. And we're also going to get better outcomes. And we're also going to insure millions of more people while lowering prices. So it's got all the what, what sort of hallmarks. What could yeah. possibly go wrong? So it's not socialism in the sense that, say, the public schools are socialism because the government's not going to own the hospitals and clinics and things like that but it will uh, set prices through things like Medicare and the other entitlement programs. It'll probably get involved you know, directly in setting prices of things like prescription drugs. Um, procedure prices are pretty much now established at the government level. So you don't actually have to take over the factory if you can just act as though you own the factory. What's the continuing romance of socialism? I mean, you know, the 20th century, even, even PBS said the 20th century was a battle between Hayek and central planning and that Hayek won. Um, so who, who is still rooting for socialism and why? I think it's a form of perpetual adolescence. You know, when you're going through adolescence, it's usually the part in your parents' life where they're working the hardest and doing the most business and making the most money. And people who never grow out of adolescence start to, in some way, I think, associate that, you know, sort of thriftiness, enterprise, hard work, all these boring bourgeois values that make the world bearable. Um, and they project it into the world at large as they grow up, and yeah, it's driven by hatred of the rich, its immaturity, its ignorance, and its uh, envy. Kevin Williamson, Deputy Managing Editor of National Review Online and the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to Socialism, thanks for talking. Thanks, Nick. I'm Nick Gillespie for Reason TV.